Likutei Sichos, Chelik Tezayin, it's volume 16, the third Sicha for Parshas Yisrael. Of course, the highlight of this week's Parsha is Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Tahar Sinai, Mount Sinai. And as such, this Sicha is a wonderful explanation that really brings out the real true effect and change that was affected by Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. And it's based on a story in the Talmud, and the Rebbe goes into the, to emphasizes on the various nuances of the verbiage of the story and the expressions in the story. And this gives us, will give us a very, very good picture, a clear picture of what Matan Torah truly affected. Before we begin, just to familiarize ourselves, in the Talmud, whenever it says, Beshuka, Shuka means literally shuk, a marketplace. It really is a reference to the outside, like to the mundane, to the, to the street, if I may. Another thing, a concept which comes up many times and quite often in Talmudical discussion, in discussion of the mitzvot, the effect of mitzvot, and the application of mitzvot, there is the gavra, and the chefza. Gavra literally means the person, and then there is the chefza, the object. In the performance of a mitzvah, there are two aspects. Sometimes there's more of one and less of the and a little less of the other. Sometimes there is exclusively one that is affected and not the other. In other words, it means that when you have, let's say, for example, kosher food, there's the object, the food itself has to be kosher, and then there is the person that he needs to eat kosher. There is two things here um, that play a role. Which one is of more importance depends on the situation. For example, if somebody makes a vow, if somebody makes a vow, the object inherently is not forbidden. But now for the person, it becomes a prohibition because the gavra had prohibited it on himself. And likewise, we'll cut just to get familiar with this, it's worthwhile for one to look it up, but this is not the place. So let's go into the Sicha. In Tractate Psachim, the Talmud over there tells us that there was a great sage, Rav Yossi, that on the day of Shavuot, the day of Shavuot is the anniversary of when we received the Torah, he would tell the people of his family, of his household, Avdeli Egla Tilsa. Make for me a third born calf, which is meaning prepare for me the choices of meat. In other words, this is this day is cause for a major celebration. And he explained, he would say, Ilav Hayoima de Kogorim, if not this day that caused meaning that caused me to be who I am, we'll see in a moment. Kama Yosef Ikovishuka. How many Yosefs were there be in the marketplace? In other words, his name was Yosef, right? How many Yosefs were there be in the marketplace? And that's why it was cause for celebration. So Rashi explains, and he says this on the words, Ilav Hayoima, if quote, not for this day. He says, What does that mean? What does it mean if not for this day, who would I be? Or what difference would I have been than than other Yosefs? So Rashi explains that I studied Torah. Vinisro Mamti, and I became elevated, I became transformed. So he says, There are so many people in the street that are called Yosef, and what would be the difference between me and them had there not been Torah? So, of course, this elicits many questions. First of all, why does he say, quote, If not for this day? Why didn't you say, If not for the Torah? Obviously, it's the Torah that's playing the role here, that's making the difference between who he was, who he would have been without Torah, and now who he is with having studied Torah. So why say it in such an anonymous, obscure way? Why doesn't he be more direct and just say, if not for Torah, who would I have been? Moreover, what really is so special about, quote, this day? What is really so special about this day of Matan Torah? We know, and this is an established fact in Jewish tradition, that, as it says in the Talmud, that from the most ancient of days of our ancestors, meaning all the way from the beginning, and throughout, and the Talmud enumerates, even through the most difficult times that the Jews experienced, meaning even during the enslavement in Egypt, they never ceased from the study of Torah. They never stopped 
learning Torah. So it was always, and all, all the time, they were privy to the teachings of Torah, and they were active in Torah and in the observance of mitzvot, as we know that it says that even way back, all the way back to Avraham Avinu, to our father Abraham, he also observed the entire Torah. So what exactly did this, quote, this day what did it actually impact? What did it actually change? Another question is, what is the emphasis, he says, if not for this day, that caused? What do you mean that caused? What does he mean that caused? Why did not he just say, if not for this day? Which means, if not for this day of Matan Torah. That's what he's talking about, the day of Shavuot. Why add the word that caused? And another thing is, why does he say, he talks about this Yosef. Of course, yes, his name was Yosef. But there, it seems to be, and we can pick up already here, that it's not just talking about him as a person. Because in that case, he could have just said, Kama inchi ika bishuka. How many people are there out there? Because he wasn't differentiating himself. He wasn't ex- expressing the fact that he is distinctive because of the name Yosef. He is distinctive because of him being not just an ordinary person, but somebody who studied Torah. So why not just say, how many other people would have been out there? Why say how many Yosefs were there out there? And also, why does he use the expression, Beshuka, in the marketplace? Why didn't he just say, how many Yosefs are there? Or how many people are there? Meaning, how many people are there out there? And what makes me different? So what is it? What is the emphasis here? The fact that it's a Shuk. That it's, quote, the marketplace, the outside. And the answer in all of this is as follows. You see, the difference between the study of Torah and the observance of mitzvot from before Matan Torah, from before the day of Shavuot and Mount Sinai, to what transformed by the giving of the Torah, is as follows. You see, before the giving of the Torah, we were all in the category of Eino Mitzuva Ve'oseh. We, we are not commanded, and yet, nevertheless, we are performing the mitzvot, which is a beautiful thing. However, because we don't have the commandment, therefore, the extent of the effect of one's Torah observance, of one's observance of the mitzvot at that time, prior to Matan Torah, was limited to affecting the gavra, the person doing the mitzvah. In other words, since he did the mitzvah, he brought, so to speak, upon himself holiness. He fulfilled a commandment a virtue of God, therefore he became somewhat uplifted. He became somewhat more spiritual, more holy. But the object with which the mitzvah was done was not transformed. The object of the, the, the meaning, the worldly object, the material object with which the person implemented that mitzvah, since the potential wasn't there, that did not become an object of holiness. Whereas after the giving of the Torah, now we are in this category of mitzvah ve'oseh. We are commanded and we perform the mitzvot. Therefore, the potential is there. The ability is there. The green light of Hashem is there. And therefore, when a person does a mitzvah, not only does the person, the gavra, become transformed, but the chefza, the object of with which we do the mitzvah, becomes transformed and becomes an object of holiness. It gets elevated and it becomes something holy. And also in the reverse. God forbid when someone does, commits a sin, it's not just that the person became degraded. But the object itself becomes an abominable object. You've now not only taken something that is off limits, that Hashem says is in the side of the negativity, but you've now pulled it down and really made of it something despicable, something negative. That's the difference of what what was before the giving of the Torah and what changed, what transformed after the giving of the Torah. And now we can understand something very, very powerful. We know the story when Avraham called his servant Eliezer, his dedicated disciple, to send him to go find a wife for Yitzchak. And he says to him, put your hand under my thigh. Why? Because when you swear, you need to swear holding in your hand the object of a mitzvah. Of course, in the court of law, the times of the Holy Temple, the Beis HaMikdash, when they did implement oaths, they would have somebody hold a Torah scroll, or at least a pair of tefillin. But Avraham didn't have that. And Avraham, the only thing he had, the only object of holiness he had was 
the object, in other words, that was transformed into holiness was his bris milah, his place of circumcision, because Hashem had commanded him to do it. And the question is, of course, didn't Avram do all the Torah and mitzvahs? Didn't he perform all the mitzvahs? Did he not have many objects of holiness that he could have perhaps offered instead, especially considering that this is very immodest and this is not proper? This is not something that you can really think of being a decent thing to do? The answer is no, there was, were no other objects. There was nothing else available to hold on to as a object of mitzvah, as an object of holiness, while while um, uh, making the oath. And therefore he had to ask him to do it. Because when Avram did the mitzvahs, all he did was he was bringing upon himself holiness. He was bringing upon himself godliness. But the object itself did not change at all. And something very interesting. Still, yet, even though Avraham performed the mitzvah of Brit Milah, of circumcision, already in a manner that is comparable to what we experience now after the giving of the Torah, meaning that he was able to, because he was commanded by Hashem, he was able to affect the Hefza, the object, and transform the object into the object of holiness, Still, yet, Maimonides, the Ramam tells us that our experience is on a totally different level. And the example for it is in this particular mitzvah. It's see, the Ramam says that when we do a circumcision, when we perform a circumcision, it's not a direct result of what was commanded to Avraham and a continuation of it. Rather, it is because we were commanded to do so by Matan Torah. In other words, it, it, it kind of restarted. It doesn't connect to that. That commandment that he received is still not as powerful as what we received at Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, the ability, the potential to transform objects of the world into objects of holiness, those things that are potentially available for that. And now we can understand the exact verbiage, the exact expression of Rabbi Yosef, his word choice. You see, what did he say? He didn't say, if not for the Torah. He said, if not for this day. Because you see, remember, prior to this day, prior to the day of the giving of the Torah, there was study of Torah. There was observance of mitzvahs. But, and, and they did it all the time. But it was not in the manner that we have it. In other words, the Yosef. Now, what does Yosef mean? Until now, we assumed Yosef is referring to the name of a person. Actually, Yosef over here is as a term. The word Yosef comes from the root word to add. And that's actually the reason why the original, the initial, the first Yosef was named Yosef. Because Rachel said to add another son. Rachel said to, that Yosef li Hashem ben Acher. So the word Yosef means to add. And what he was saying is he wasn't referring to himself as the Yosef that he is comparing to other Yosefs. But rather he was saying, how many Yosefs? You see, when you do a mitzvah, you add something. You increase. You bring an increase of holiness into the world. And he's, that's what he's saying. That if there was not the day of Matan Torah, had it not been for this day, then the Yosef that would have been affected by the study of Torah and performance of mitzvah would have been in the shuka. It would have remained in the outside world. In other words, it wouldn't have been strong enough. This addition of holiness would have not have been strong enough to transform the object and, so to speak, pull it out of the mundane and elevate it to a whole different domain, to put it in a whole different place, that it doesn't remain in the shuka, in the outside street, so to speak, but it becomes something that's part of the inner uh, so to speak, the inner domain, the inner circle of godliness. And that's what he was saying. Kama Yosef. How many additions would have been, but they would have been Bishuka because the objects would have not have changed. Only because of Matan Torah, only because of the giving of the Torah, did, 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 did it now become possible that when there is a Yosef, when there is an addition, when somebody does a mitzvah and incurs an increase of holiness, that it actually does not remain Bishuka, but it becomes elevated, it becomes transformed to the point that it now 
goes out from the regular domain and goes into a new domain. It's no longer, quote, in the street. And now we can also understand the emphasis of Rashi. Rashi says, if you recall, Rashi translates, Rashi explains, he's, that what I also was saying is that I study Torah, vinis romanti, and I got elevated. Why does Rashi add this word and I got elevated? That's exactly the point. What Rashi is telling us is that what Rav Yosef was saying is not only that I study, do I study Torah now, but now when I study Torah, I become transformed. You see, even before Matan Torah, yes, we maintained previously that the Gavra, the individual, the person would have been affected by the holiness, but still it's not to the same degree that one is affected post Matan Torah. You see, because before Matan Torah, since there was no ability for the actual object to transform, to transform and become something else, so so too the person himself didn't fully become transformed, didn't fully become something else. He became affected. He became inspired, so to speak, by the intellect and by the emotions and by the inspirations of godliness that was in the Torah and Mitzvot, but he himself did not become Nisramamti, did not become elevated, did not, so to speak, enter a whole different realm. And now we can also better appreciate why he uses the term, quote, the Kagorim. If you recall, we asked, why does he say, if not for this day, that caused? What does it mean that caused? Why did he just say, if not for this day? Now let's think for a moment. What is the true definition of cause? Cause meaning that doesn't directly do something, but it causes or it gives the ability, it makes the potential, it sets something in motion that allows for something to happen or causes something to happen. This is so apropos here. You see, what was the difference between before Matan Torah and after Matan Torah? What is the difference? The difference is that it was limited to the Gavra, to the person. But the object, why wouldn't the object become transformed? Because the potential wasn't there. In other words, it wasn't in the category even of becoming something holy. It wasn't even in the potential category. Okay? And this brings us a good illustration of this back to Avram Avinu and his bris milah. The famous question, why didn't Avram do the circumcision? He did every other single mitzvah. He ate matzah on Pesach, he prayed, he studied Torah, he did all kinds of mitzvahs. Why not this mitzvah? This is, this is a, such an important mitzvah. And the answer is, because if he would have circumcised himself prior to being commanded directly by Hashem to do so, all he would have done is just injuring himself. He would have just been cutting his flesh. He would not have done anything whatsoever as far as a mitzvah is concerned. And he wouldn't have affected anything. And therefore, he had to wait until HaKadosh Baruch Hu, until Hashem commanded him to do so. Now, of course, the argument can be made, well, if the reason he didn't do it is because he didn't have the ability to affect the object, then what was his eating of matzah, for example? His consuming of matzah or any other mitzvah, how did that affect anything? Well, the answer over there is, over there, it's not about transforming the matzah, it's about the individual partaking, the individual ingesting the idea, the concept of matzah, which he did. So to that degree that the individual was able to be affected, that degree that potentially there was for the, for the individual to get affected, prior to Matan Torah, he did. But over here, had he cut his flesh, since it wasn't even yet in the potential, in the category of becoming elevated, all he would have done is not only he wouldn't have been accomplishing a mitzvah and injecting holiness into his flesh, and only injuring himself, but worse, he would have now prevented the potential of doing the mitzvah when Hashem tells him to do so. And therefore he couldn't do it. And therefore he couldn't do it. And the same thing is by us. You see, when we have now the commandment, we are mitzvah v'oysa, we are commanded and we perform. What does this mean? That means that the objects already have the full-fledged potential in them. It's almost like everything is built in there. All we need to do now is, so to speak, activate. Let's take, for example, even something that's prohibited. You see, that thing is in a category of, a category of prohibition. It, it's not allowed. You're not allowed to do something with it. It's, in other words, it's potentially despicable. 
but it's almost like in a certain sense, it's almost like neutral. If you don't do anything with it, if the Jew does not commit the sin with that object, that object kind of remains where it is. The moment the Jew takes a chas v'shalom, does the avera, commits the sin, eats the thing that he shouldn't be eating, or does the thing he shouldn't be doing, he now pulls the thing down, he now takes the object and turns it into a despicable object. And of course, in the good, when a when a Jew takes any whatsoever mitzvah, it takes an object, I mean, a material object that is potentially there for mitzvah, whether it's an eshrog, whether it's a piece of matzah, whether it's a parchment on which tefillin is written, and does the mitzvah with it, the person has now taken that thing and elevated it. It has now become totally transformed to holiness because the potential was there. The potential was... was um, the ability for it to happen, Hashem made it happen. And this is, this is what changed on this day, okay? Of course, it's obvious that it's not enough to allow it to stay in potential. That's the point. One needs to do it. But the cause, what caused it? What caused that now when I do the mitzvah, it should actually become an object of holiness, an object of a mitzvah. The cause for it was the day of Matan Torah. So on, in short, what happened at Matan Torah is everything was put into a cause. It was put into the potential of being a mitzvah. But the actual implementation of elevating the thing, or God forbid the opposite of pulling it down, that depends on the person. And that's what we are, where we come in, but only after Matan Torah, after the potential was given. And a good example for this point and one which will illustrate the impact of this potential, we see in a very interesting thing. We see it in a medrash in the Chilta, and we actually recite this in the Haggadah. You might recognize it. And this is, this is we say as follows. The verse says, You shall relate to your son by Yom Hahu, on that day, saying, Because of this, Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. Now what does it mean because of this? And what does it mean on that day? So obviously it's talking, if you look at the context, it's talking about Pesach. So why does Hashem have to make this emphasis in the Torah? So the Mechilta tells us, and we say this in Haggadah, that Yochel, I would think that perhaps the obligation of telling your child, relating to your children about the story of Pesach, perhaps it begins on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, not on the night of the 15th, when they actually left Egypt, but on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And therefore it says, Bayom Hahu, on that day. Oh, continues the Mechilta. Perhaps if it only would say by Yom Ahu, I would think maybe even on the 14th, on the eve of Pesach, and therefore it says Bavur Zeh, because of this, that only when you have this, which is the Matzah and the Moror and the Passover offering right there in front of you, when it's in a matter of Zeh, when you can point to it and say, this is it, here it is. Why would I think that the obligation begins on Rosh Chodesh? What would be even the thinking? And it's obviously a legitimate um, thinking. Because if not, there would be no need for the verse and for the Talmud, for the, for, the, for, the, for the Medrash, to negate it. So it's obviously legitimate. Why would it be legitimate? What is the justification? What is the idea that way before Pesach in advance, two weeks in advance of Pesach, there should already be an obligation to talk about Pesach and to teach and relate the story of Pesach to your children? The answer is, based on what we said, when did the Jews get the commandment to do the mitzvahs of Pesach, to offer the Passover offering, to eat matzah and moror on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, two weeks in advance. And based on what we said above, the moment they were given the commandment, they became mitzvah v'oysa, they became now commanded and had the potential now of implementing it and bringing it about. Now we understand that at that moment, all this became already potentially the objects of Pesach. And therefore, the potential, the cause was already set into motion. I would think that that's when the clock of Pesach starts to tick. And that's when, therefore, you should start to relate it to your son, based on what we said above. Because the mitzvah potential is already there. Because the commandment is there. Right? And therefore, we needed to get it, to negate it, and it has to be clarified. The Torah has to tell us, Bavur Zeh. No, 
that in this case it's not enough that the potential is there and therefore Pesach is already in the air Pesach already is there in potential but you need to have the actual Zeh you need to have the actual thing right in front of you meaning in an implemented manner the, ma- the Matzah, the Pesach, the Mora has to be in front of you, has to be a mitzvah that's implemented in order for, for it to trigger the obligation of telling your son. And this is what is meant when we said caused, this day caused. That this day of Matan Torah causes and affects a change, but it didn't change the thing itself. In other words, it gave the cause for change, but it didn't change the thing. And this explains why. It's not enough to just celebrate Matan Torah. Not just enough to commemorate this day that gave cause and potential for the transformation of objects and the person himself for you know, elevating for Kedusha. But we need to actually implement it. We need to actually do the Torah mitzvahs in order to bring this about. Now, there's another several chapters to this Sicha, but this brings out the main point, the gist of what the Rebbe is explaining. 